Selamat sore, selamat malam, uh, and welcome to our first Monash Indonesia Seminar of 2020. And I'm really thrilled that actually I've, I've made it to Melbourne, although we're kind of still in Zoom mode, but that's okay. Um, and I want to start by acknowledging and paying respect to the traditional custodians of the Kulin land, where many of us, including me today, um, are. And I'd also like to acknowledge and pay some respects to the elders of the land, both past, present and emerging, and acknowledge that claims to sovereignty were never ceded. My name's Sharon Graham Davies, and I'm the director of the Herb Beef Indonesia Engagement Center here at Monash. So I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome all of you from across the world, especially from Indonesia. Just a few housekeeping points. Firstly, you will have seen the, the little thing that popped up to say that we're recording uh, and we'll make this available shortly uh, on our Herb Feath website. Uh, I might also just jump in with a little plug that we're doing our first Herb Feath dialogue. Uh, thank you, Lauren, <laughs> who's working tirelessly on that. So that'll be on the 25th of February. So stay, stay tuned for that. We have the um, Australian ambassador to Indonesia being our keynote. Uh, and also I want to encourage all of you to write questions into the chat box. Uh, and we've got some time towards the end uh, of this session to, to uh, have a Q&A. And then just finally, please all sign up uh, and follow us on Facebook and on our Twitter um, page to keep abreast of all of our activities. Now, before introducing our speaker, I'd like to turn over to Rennie uh, and she's going to tell us about the fantastic library resources that we have here uh, at Monash. So, Rennie. Thank you very much, Sharon. Uh, welcome everyone to our first me session in 2021. What a year we had last year. Uh, we were sort of hoping that um, we can uh, go back to our face-to-face -face, um, miss, but unfortunately we're still doing it through Zoom. Um, well, there is a, a benefit of doing it through Zoom because now we can see people not just in Australia, not just in Melbourne, but also from um, other parts of the world. So my name is Reni Pulungan. I'm the subject librarian for Indonesian studies. Um, as usual, what I would like to just highlight some of the things that we have in our collection. So um, the, uh, the book that we are going to discuss today is available through uh, Monash Library catalog. So if I can share my screen. So this is the uh, the book. So all I did was just uh, putting in the part of the title of uh, the book. So performing the arts of Indonesia. So as you can see here, the book is available as hard copy. Unfortunately, I am still trying to uh, find <laughs> and order the e-book of this. Um, so we definitely have it in medicine. Um, um, and we we will be hoping to get an ebook for this one as well. Um, the other thing that um, I would like to touch on, we have lots of uh, books and um, especially books on on Riau, Kepulauan Riau, performing arts, um, culture. So if you if you are interested in reading more about it, you can always. Um, put in some keywords in the catalog and then find the book that we have in the library. The other thing that I would like uh, to touch on is um, if you happen to be at Matheson Library, uh, I set up a, uh, a display um, of books and other collections um, that are, are related to uh, our uh, the late um, Professor Mel Rickloves. Um, unfortunately, because, because we are still under restriction, um, not many people have seen the, the display, so I would uh, encourage you uh, to uh, go and see it. It's a beautiful display. Um, it has all the books that pa Pat Mel Rickloves um, uh, wrote, and also some of the rare collection that he donated to the Indonesian collection. So um, if, you, if you can and if you happen to be at Matheson, please go up to level one where the display is. Okay, so I'm handing it over back to Sharon. Thank you. Great, thanks, Rennie. So today we are joined by Professor Margaret Katomi, and I suspect that she doesn't need introducing to any of us. We will be all very familiar uh, with her extraordinary, extraordinary efforts over her career. And the specific event that brings us together today is the launch of Margaret's new book, Performing the Arts of Indonesia, Malay Identity and Politics in the Music, Dance and Theatre of the Riau 
Islands. So we have an action-packed seminar today. I'm not going to take up any more time chatting and I'm going to hand straight over to Professor Harry Aveling, who is going to officially launch the book. Thank you. It's a great honour to be asked to launch this book at Monash University. Let me begin by telling a story. In 2006, I was at the University of North Sumatra and someone asked me, where are you now? Oh, I'm teaching at the University of Indonesia, I replied. Oh, came the response. That's a Javanese university, isn't it? I was surprised. No, Gajamadu is Javanese. No, University of Indonesia is a Javanese university. And when I thought about it, all the lecturers I knew were Javanese. So it didn't seem so impossible that that was a Javanese university. But it set me thinking, there was Java and there was Sumatra and they were different. And they haven't always got on. In fact, there's resentment quite often between the two. Some very historical in Sajara Malayu when Hang Tua goes to Majapahit and makes fools of the emperor. And some very recent where Riau in general was the richest province in Indonesia, but it was rich because it had oil and petrol and plantations and industry and the people were among the poorest in Indonesia. So there was a great imbalance. And decades of neglect and internal colonization under Suharto, an attempt to begin to fix this after Suharto stepped down. And finally in July 2004, when the Rio Islands were formally known as a new and distinct province. The title of Margaret's book, Let's have the cover of the book, Rennie. You can put it in your book, Rennie. Title of Margaret's book captures these two dimensions. One, the arts of Indonesia. Two, the Malay identity. And it's not just the Malay identity and politics equal performing arts. It's in a sense that challenging Indonesia as well. Because the Malay identity and politics of Kupula Riau often serve to represent an identity and politics that's in opposition to Java. And the book works on these two dimensions. It begins, the very first paragraph is actually a statement that the book was conceived and completed on unceded lands belonging to the Kulin Nation in Australia. It's conventional, but it warns you when the cartoon comes up by Lunik, if we can have a cartoon now, yeah, that something political is going on besides just description of theatre, arts and music. I hear sea level rising. I hear blue fin tuna being hunted. I hear boat people crying. I hear villages being swept away. I want my iPod back. But Rial is under pressure. The sea people are under pressure. And Malay language and culture is what the island uses to represent its identity and its separate identity. And it's Malay culture and because the people of Kapula and Rio include Chinese and boat people, presumably they're part of my Malay identity too. So how does the interaction work? Three ways. Let's just have the cover back again. First, the Malay arts are part of a rapidly fading traditional culture of Kapula and Rio, which is different from that of Java. Much of the book is historical. And as such, the arts are pre-Indonesian, part of a courtly world that has its own local wisdom, dignity, and integrity. So in this case, Malay identity and politics wins. 
because it's separate from that of Java. Secondly, however, in this balancing relationship, Capri is now unavoidably part of the nation. Traditional Malay arts are under pressure from modern mass culture and technology. So this is the world of radio, television, CDs, DVDs, Lagu Pop, um, rock, heavy metal. And so in this case, the traditional world of Rio it loses. The arts of Indonesia win, come out ahead. Thirdly, the Malay arts that do survive hardly survive because Indonesia supports certain arts for a specific reason. These are part of a new cultural identity. Each region must have its own identity, its own clothing and its own housing as well. But the arts represent the region to the world. And this is partly under Java encouragement. Achiola and Patrick Guinness have described this as state interference and simplification of complex artistic reality. Margaret and the contributors are much more positive that in this case, people are actually developing genuine and authentic Malay arts in a new and significant way. So there's a subtext in the title and in the whole book, particularly coming to Nicholas Long's essay at the end. I want to say it's a wide ranging book, it covers not only ethnomusicology, but history, anthropology, theater studies and local wisdom. Chapters are full of detail written by outstanding local and international experts in their field. Experts who have consulted widely with major artists produced highly coherent and detailed studies. They've spent long periods in the region working with people on the ground. They're theoretically informed. This is a text that's very worth reading. A text that's worth reading and a subtext that's worth reading as well to see what else is going on. I'm happy to launch the book into the Monash that has nurtured Margaret and nurtures the contributors. The Monash of her faith of the 60s that the center is known after and also the Monash of the year 2001. Sail well book, sail well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Harry. Uh, and now I'd love to uh, give the stage to Margaret. Well, thank you, Sharon, and hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce you to a wonderful new province of Indonesia, the Rio Islands, which Harry was just speaking about. And it's quite unique performing arts that encapsulate the islands as character, history and identity. Its border is drawn in this map here. If you look at the lower, lower map, you see a red dotted line around the province. Uh, it's, as you can see, it's mainly sea. In fact, it's very unusual in that 96% of its surface is sea. You know that it's got a deep blue color in its, in its sea area. It's just south of Singapore and up to the northeast into the South China Sea. That's the new province which was created only 16 years ago in 2004. Um, the province is popularly known as Capri, short for Kapulan Rio or Rio Islands. Though the acronym Capri has of course nothing to do with the Isle of Capri in the Mediterranean. Capri, the province in, in Indonesia, is a historically highly significant part of what one of the authors of the book chapters, Leonard Andaya, calls the Southern Malay world, noted for its asli Malay yet kachukan or culturally hybrid arts. The pre province is, uh, has 2,400 islands sprinkled like a shake of pepper, as the poets say, sprinkled across the Straits of Malacca and the South China Sea. For two millennia, the islands have formed part of the maritime Silk Road between China and Southeast, South and West Asia. Between the years 1400 and 1911, they constituted the Malay Kingdom of Johor, Rio, Linga and Pahang, which ended when the Netherlands colonial power finally gained military control and forced the last Sultan to flee to Singapore. 
the kingdom produced famous poet philosophers and scholars of Islam, such as Raja Ali Haji, who in 1847 published the famous Gurindam Duablas poem, offering local wisdom. Later in this hour, we are going to hear a, a fresh recording of Gurindam Duablas, sung by our friends in Tanjung Pinang, who have helped us so much in our research, and who came to Monash in Melbourne three years ago, and formed, performed dances and music. They are the singer Dwi Saturini, who is here today, and Adi Linkapin, playing a gumbus lute accompaniment to the song. They recorded this song only this morning and just sent it to us today as their contribution to our team of 15 authors who wrote the book. Despite its proximity to Singapore, Capri's songs, music, martial arts, dance and theatre are only now beginning to become known outside its borders, which you can see in that red dotted line around there in the lower map. And if you look at the upper maps, there's two upper maps, uh, you can see there are five political divisions or kabupaten in, the, uh, in those maps. So these five kabupaten or districts include Bintan and uh, Karimun, southwest of Singapore, as discussed in the book by Raja Alfira Findra and Rina Matiara, who focus on the Zapin dancing. Then Jeffrey Benjamin on the art music. Vivian Wee on kinship among former Royal Penyungat musicians. And Jenny McCallum and myself on the formerly Royal vocal and no but instrumental music. Another district is Linga in the Southwest discussed by Bronya Kornhauser, who focuses on the Bangsawan theater. Also, Brigitte Scarf and Muhammad Haspi, who discussed the traditional and the virtuoso new viola music or violin music. Violin is, is the most popular instrument of a vocal nature or a melodic nature of a, throughout, throughout the whole of the islands and has been since 500 years ago when the viola was brought by the Portuguese to this area. Another area is Kabupaten Nambas in the northeast, which is discussed by Shafaruddin, Manaleta, Mora, and myself on the Masked Gobang Theatre, which is an amazing, amazing performance. We, I'd love to tell you more, but I haven't got time. And the fifth Kabupaten is Natuna in the extreme northeast, uh, in the southern part of the South China Sea, an area discussed in the book by Karen Kaitoni Thomas who focuses on its uniquely Malay Mundu folk theater, dance and music. Today, Capri's two million inhabitants still share a, a, a seafaring worldview that is expressed in the performing arts of its largest and its smallest population groups. Next slide, please. Uh, the Capri Malays, next slide, thank you. And the formerly nomadic Orang Suku Laut, or people of the sea but also the large migrant population in the urban centers, Tanjung, Pinang and Bintbatam, the punk, hardcore, metal, progressive rock and hip hop music discussed by Manaleta Mora, as Harry Evelyn just mentioned. And so if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, the car, this is our next one. After that, I haven't got time to explain it. And the next one, please. So this is where the Orang Laut live. They, love living in boats, in their houseboats on the sea. They don't like living on the land most of the time, except when the weather is inclement. And here the women um, cook and they give birth even. They, they spend all their lives there, the men too, and the, and the children even catching fish. Uh, they just love living on the land, on the, on the sea, on the, in their boats. And for their rituals, they go to the local beaches, very isolated beaches, because they don't like to be disturbed. And there they perform shamanic dances and uh, you know, uh, 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 requests to the sea spirits to bring in the fish and all those kinds of things. This is all discussed by um, researcher Cynthia Chow, who's also here today. Um, and we'll hear more on them from her uh, later this hour. In the next slide is, um, this is one, I won't talk about that any further because Harry has already discussed it, but this is just drawing attention to the plight of the people who live on the sea and how they are losing their land and their sea and they're in a bit of a bit of a problem, problematic situation, very much of a problematic situation. Next slide, it's a, it's a principle. This is about all our, most of our chapters are about this, um, when we talk about the music and dance and the theatre, but also about the uh, sea, like the, the martial arts and also the um, 
even the visual arts, you know, the cloth design and the architecture, etc. The whole principle of, of creation, of invention, of generation, generating uh, continuity are the motives or memory codes that facilitate artistic invention in performance. So all those art forms are normally performed without rehearsal by groups who rely on time-worn motives or memory codes, to quote uh, Kelly, um, to help them generate continuity in their performances, which are not reliant on written guides. Examples are the melodic and rhythmic melodic codes or formulae that constantly recur in the poetry with fillers such as in the famous Indonesian song, Rasa Sayang E, Rasa Sayang E, Rasa Sayang Sayang E, etc. And in a mem melodic mem memory code, I'm going to play for you now in a viola or violin accompaniment to a silat or a martial art performance. Dun, so it's one, one, six. This, this is the, how it can be written. So can we go to the next one and we can hear the, the performance here. It's a clip of the Silat Hung Tua, uh, referred to by Harry, linked to the royal culture of the Adat Diraja and performed in a circle. I'm going to talk about spatial concepts of the Orang Lark and the Malays in a minute. This is also the icon of one of the regencies featuring viola, gong and gandang motifs. It's the icon of Capri. Can you hear that please? islands uh, we find different forms of the hung tua form of the art of self-defense sometimes there are five people fighting against 20 others uh, you know, in the silat and it's, it's a tremendous variety of silat um, of martial arts in this area all based on the famous hero malay hero uh, hung tua whom the people of these islands believe was born in their area now okay next next slide please yes i'm just going to go now uh, outline some of the main, the, the main, this is it, yeah, concepts of cosmological and performative space. So in that performance uh, was the first of the spatial concepts of the Malays, the circle with centre point as expressed in the Sea People's Beach Dances, the Islanders' Martial Arts, Gobanga Mahyong Dances. And then there's a concentric circle as expressed in the Circular Kingdom with a king at the centre point and decreasingly powerful circular spaces towards the kingdom's periphery and in some textile and wood carving designs. Number three is the square cardinal directional concept of space or design, uh, north, south, east and west, with the centre point associated with the winds, colours and metals, expressed in the layout of the king's palace and in the Zopin dance, where the dancers mainly move from the cardinal points towards the centre point and back. The fourth concept of space, which is ancient but is still dominant in the arts, is the concentric square as expressed in the Royal Audience Hall, the Ballet Rung Sri, and the Mundu and Bangsawan Theatre Stage in Latuna Regency, with a square room within the outer square for the king. The fifth one is the linear and parallel linear concept that's expressed in processions and some dances. And finally, the triangular betel nut leaf shape as expressed by the visual icon of the real islands problems today. Can we go to the next one, please? Thanks. So this is the circular, the first concept, the circular concept of space, typified by the Orang Lauk, um, their ceremonial dances with a powerful shaman at the centre point. And then this concentric circular concept of space of the kingdom, uh, with the monarch at the powerful centre and decreasingly powerful spaces towards the periphery. And then these uh, Capri carving and textile designs with concentric circles in royal yellow, concentric circles uh, used in the cloth design and in the architecture and in the, um, in, in the uh, carvings. Next one, please. It's just examples of the first few. And this, this is an example of the, um, go, oh no, so go back, please. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, of the spatial concept one, a Goban performance of a circular stage in the Anambas area, including humorous regimented dancing of faceless colonials in suits in the 19th century, which contrasts with the free dancing of the locals. This is very ironic, this kind of an anti-colonial. Gobang is the official artistic icon of the modern Anambas Regency. And there's the music, the, the musicians playing drums and gongs mainly, and also an oboe sometimes. Next one, please. This is the, uh, another example of spatial concept one with dancers, couples dancing in the middle, um, performing the Joget Dangkung, which is an icon of the Karimun Regency. Next, please. And then the spatial concept two example with the Mat Yong Theatre performed in a concentric circle. Uh, the, in this case, there's a prince in the middle with the, everyone sitting around the edge. Uh, it's an icon of the modern Bintan Regency. This, this theatre uh, goes back to the 15th century. There's evidence that it's as old as the 15th century. Thanks, next one. Now here's spatial concept three, the cardinal directional square, um, north, south, east and west, and uh, according to Malay concepts all over the Malay world. Um, there, this is all associated with the seasons. For example, the east is associated with white and silver and uh, the east wind and up north here, it's north black, iron, etc. That's the layout of the palaces. And here's the um, entrance to the palace ruins in the south in Linga Island, built in Dutch architectural style about a hundred years ago. Going on to the next one, please. And the spatial concept four, the, the audience hall of the king in the Diet Linga Palace, up to nine levels of platform rises to accommodate the hierarchical seating arrangements of the monarch subjects, and with the monarch seated at the highest central point, which we saw in an actual uh, installation of a king in 1887 in a Dutch photo I'll show you now in a minute. Next one, please. So this is the special concept for four duos of Zapin dancing dancers moving in and out of a concentric square performance space. Zapin dancing is now an icon of Peningat Island, which is the second uh, royal center of the former kingdom. Next one, please. And this is a design of the Earthen Mindu performance play, uh, theater in um, the Natuna area. With all the people around the edge and it's concentric squares with the king's center, uh, king and all his, his courtiers in the center and then actions around here, the forest sea and palace gardens and the fighting scenes and the tree of life which is so essential down here. So my, uh, this is the icon of the modern Natuna Regency and the drawing is by Karen Thomas, Matthew Skinner. Next one please. It's a traditional Mindu um, earthen, earthen um, stage but this is a modern modern performance of Mindu, which is not on an earthen stage anymore, it's in actual hall. But the spatial concept still governs the Mindu theatre stage. Um, the king and the courtiers in a meeting on the, on the left with the fan and, uh, and then the, on the right is the prince rescuing a princess who is under a spell because she's been turned into an elephant. You can see her elephant kind of costume there. Thank you, next one. And then special concept for the Bangsa one theatre performance on a square stage with an inner sanctum uh, there where the king is, showing the Malays defeating Dutch soldiers in battle in 1784. Bangsa one is the icon of the modern Linda Regency as described by uh, Bronya Kornhardt in the book. That's, and then special concept five, the linear or parallel linear concept of space for processions. Um, it's a very important kind of concept of space as well. And then finally, um, Oh, sorry, this is still processions in parallel linear formation. This is a photo from uh, 1887 from the Dutch archives, colonial archives. Uh, here the king is in this very high up um, um, tent for uh, which um, the Dutch organized for this coronation or this um, installation because they were just worried that um, there was, wasn't enough space or something and some kind of security problem and all the courtiers came along here and they're up here there were the wives and then the courtiers. Oh, sorry. <gasps> Done it again. Sorry. I'm just, yeah. And then um, uh, all the. <laughs> okay. So we'll move now to the um, orchestra of the royal court called the Nobat, which is uh, from around the 14th century, the Arab, Islamic, and Mughal uh, type of 
ensemble of musical instruments. Um, the Nobat were superimposed on the existing animist Malay Hindu Buddhist cosmology of the people of Capri and their artistic practice, not only of course in, um, in this area, but in a number of Southeast Asia's Malay kingdoms. Um, and then below is, this is the essential heirloom of the king. If the king doesn't, if the king loses or loses his uh, orchestra while at sea or whatever, he can't rule anymore. It's absolutely essential. Uh, and this is the, a picture of the new Nobat instrumental ensemble without which the king could not be installed in, in, 19, in 1887, that photo we just saw. The Nobat was the audio visual icon of the monarch in the former kingdom of Rialinga. The drums are decorated with leaf shaped and triangular spatial concepts and designs. And the next slide, please, um, shows another shot of that same orchestra. Powerful high status Nobat instruments are the foreign Nafiri trumpet from the Middle East, and the foreign Nangara goblet drum, and the Malay cylindrical drums displayed here in their royal yellow covers. And then there's the oboes, etc., all in the royal yellow. Here's the, the oboes, which are lower status instruments, but they're the main melodic instruments. Mm. Then there's, um, well, that's the, they also had the flute and metal cymbals and others, other things, but not gongs. That gong down the bottom is kept, kept with the uh, Nobat Orchestra in Capri today in the capital city in a museum, but it's actually a Javanese gong, doesn't belong to the Nobat. And the next slide, please. This is the, you know, in the past, the Nobat was the essential uh, heirloom of the king, without which he could not rule. But from the middle of the 19th century, Queen Habida in Paninat, which is a secondary palace in uh, Capri, um, uh, had this, uh, was given this uh, beautiful gold, uh, betel nut shaped um, kind of icon, um, which has got all Arabic writing on it. And it's very, very significant, very, 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 very magical. Um, so the, the Nobat, the orchestra, is no longer the icon of the Rio Islands. It's now this, um, this, this is exemplifying the traditional concept of space. The sixth one I told you about, it's in solid gold, metal nut, leaf shaped, and was confiscated by the Dutch, but the original now is in the National Museum in Jakarta. So that's the six kinds of concepts of, of space. I'm running out of time. I'm just going to jump now. I'll just show you a few of the shots of, of performances. The uh, orchestra on the top left, um, uh, viola, and the um, drums, drum and the gong, is accompanying a, a martial arts performance of Sila Hong Kong tour. And the next one is a shot of the Bangsa Wan theatre uh, stage with the king sitting on his throne and the uh, his servants down below. Um, bowing to fight the Dutch on his behalf. And then on the right, at the top there, this is a, uh, it's called um, Silat Lima with five, there must be five people for fighting in it. And uh, it's very, very complicated. Extremely amazing, amazing number of performance um, movements. Down below on the left is the Ronggeng or Joget Malay dancing in couples, which is very popular still. And then finally, some Zapin dancing accompanied by Gambus. And later on, we're going to hear um, Dwi Saptarini accompanying, accompanied by uh, Gambus, like that instrument on the right there, um, accompanied by Adi Linkapin. We're going to hear an excerpt of that. So just remember, please, that um, Gambus, the look, look at the Gambus that's going to be accompanying Dwi uh, singing the Gurindam Duablas song. So I'm finished, so thank you very much. Lovely, thank you, Margaret. And now we have um, a compilation of just very short one or two minute clips from some of the contributors because Nick Long, for instance, is in London and it's 2 a.m. or some terribly unsuitable time. So we've made a, a small compilation. Hello, to give you a taste of some of Capri's music and theatre performances, some authors have prepared brief introductions to the chapters in the book. One is Cynthia Chow, an associate professor at Ohio University in the United States. She wrote on the music of the Rio Island sea peoples who live on boats at sea when weather permits. Living afloat the waters of the Rio Archipelago are groups of sea nomads known as the Orang Sukulaut or tribal people of the sea. 
and sounds of the maritime world have always had special meanings for them. My chapter looks at how, by listening to sounds emanating from a society, we comprehend a people's reflections concerning how they would present themselves in the world. Changes are occurring in the Orang Suku Laut's auditory environment. Two forms of music, pop music and church music, are gaining popularity within their communities. And today, pop music is the preferred form of music among the younger mariners. And for them, this is a sonic bridge to wider international musical movements. And church music is another style that is becoming culturally significant among the Orang Suku Laut. Indonesian authorities view the Orang Suku Laut as a backward people without religion. And listening to church music serves as an educational tool and depicts a modern and progressive lifestyle. Pop and church music are sound examples and expels in sound of how the Orang Suku Laut negotiate change in continuity and continuity in change. Another author is PhD candidate Brigitte Scarf at the University of Western Australia, who collaborated with the Capri-born ethnomusicologist Muhammad Hasbi to write a chapter on the Rio Islands main melodic instrument, the viola or violin. The contribution that Hasby and I have made to the book focuses on the violin or the viola in Malay and how viola playing styles interact with place. In particular, we explore the playing styles and lived experiences of two viola players in Capri, Pat Nasri, an older viola player from rural Linga, and Adi Linkpin, who lives in Capri's capital city, Tanjung Pinang, on Pulau Bintan. We focus on the viola because it is the main melodic instrument throughout the Riau Islands, including on the former royal island of Linga in the south, where Nasri adopts a more traditional or traduci style, and in the urban capital where Adi plays a more virtuoso viola style. One of our key arguments is that these different stylistic approaches to the playing of the viola are in part due to differences in the social and geographic locations. Now, Bronya Kornhauser, the archivist at the Music Archive of Monash University, wrote a chapter on Capri's Bangsawan music and theatre. Many communities in the Linga archipelago maintain a strong affinity to the golden age of the Linga Riau Sultanate, which from the late 18th century was centred in Daik, Linga's capital. Bangsawan, a Malay musical theatre genre, presents an ideal forum for the artistic expression of that affinity. Using resources housed in the Music Archive of Monash University, my chapter compares two performances by an esteemed Bangsawan troupe from Sinkap Island and examines ways in which recurring motifs in plots, costumes, backdrops, dialogue and music convey and reaffirm local collective memory of Linga's grand bygone era. The most distinctive feature of Linga Bangsawan, however, is the use of a contemplative Sha'ir verse as narrator. Always sung to the same popular Malay melody and usually introduced and accompanied by Biola, the Sha'ir serves as a link between scenes, summarising the action about to take place in each. A Sha'ir example from the Tanjung Pinang performance can be heard in Margaret Kartomi's PowerPoint. Manaleta Mora, the Associate Professor of Music at the University of New South Wales, wrote about local aesthetic responses to socio-cultural transformation in Capri's two cities. In the commercial centre of Batam City in Capri province, which is part of the free trade zone in the Indonesia-Malaysia-Singapore growth triangle, segments of youth culture create collectives that form a diverse underground music scene. Local authorities, partly motivated by cultural politics, tend to deny the participation of local Malays in the scene and therefore the realities of cultural production in the city. For some local Malay underground participants, hardcore is a way of life, a philosophy that guides them in daily life and is underpinned by the punk do-it-yourself ethic, which entails cooperative tasks that foster mutual trust and opportunities for income. 
pushed to the margins of mainstream society, hardcore and other underground collectives organise their events in particular spaces that tend to take on symbolic significance and which become part of the scene identity. Communitarian commitment is manifested not only in the way individuals and collectives cooperate and collaborate at the local level, but also at the regional and international levels. Nicholas Long, the Associate Professor of Anthropology at the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London, wrote about competing visions of Malayness in the music of Capri in his chapter titled, Who Cares About Malay Music? This is the title track of the album Gunung Bintan by the Kepri music group Trio Komodo. It's great, but is it Malay music? Is it Malay culture? Well, some in the Riau Islands would say that it couldn't be. The artists are Florinese, some of them are Catholic. And so for these critics, that kind of performance with Florinese people dressed as Malay sultans would be little more than cultural appropriation. But for the performers, it's an innovative contribution to Malay culture, combining both Florinese and Malay influences. It doesn't disavow their Florinese origins, but nor does it let those origins rigidly define them. Instead, it expresses their membership in the province through an exploration of their own dialectical relationship with Malayness. So in the multicultural Riau Islands, there's a distinctly political acoustimology. What one hears when one hears Malay music could be inclusion, acceptance, appropriation, or rejection. And what I argue in my contribution to this volume is that it's precisely those debates and anxieties about belonging that are the beating heart of Malay culture in Kepri today. Excellent, excellent. Oh, that was lovely, lovely to hear. Um, and shout out to our IT people who managed to get that little <laughs> compilation going. Um, so now we've got a few minutes for questions. We've also got another little um, uh, musical performance to watch, which is just about a minute. And then we'll probably finish it at six. And for people who can stay, we're going to show 10 minutes of the film. Uh, but now I'd love to open up to some questions. I think we've got some in the chat already. Uh, raise your hands or shout out. Uh, we'll take questions however they come. There is already one in the chat, um, Sharon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do you want to read it out, Anita? Yeah, um, this is from Rohan. Are there any similar similarities between these spatial concepts? I think that's the concepts that Bu uh, Margaret elaborated before. And those illustrated by the mandala, which is somewhat represented in central Japanese gamelan, or are they completely different things? Now, if I may say something on that, Rohan, it's um, the culture of the Japanese, is it like the like in uh, Capri and in the Malay world in general, is it goes back to you know, the last 2000 years to Hindu Buddhist and before that animist concepts. The six concepts that I presented today that uh, we found expressed in all the arts, you know, visual and performing arts in Capri, um, are also found in uh, the traditional cultures of many parts of Southeast Asia. Because they have this, uh, they're very, like the Orang Lao too, the people who live on the sea, they have all those cult, those um, those forms, you know, the, the circle and the concentric circle and the concentric um, the square and all those other ones that I mentioned and the, uh, the the leaf, the betel nut leaf shape. Um, they're found in many parts of Indonesia, not only in Capri, but it was interesting to see them in Capri because we had we saw examples of them everywhere. They go back to the pre-Islamic period, and therefore they're found in many parts of Indonesia, including Java, including Central Java. The mandala concept is um, well the actual word mandala and we didn't find in capri but the concept of mandala is there as well but the cultural unity with this this part of the world southeast asia including um, even thailand and cambodia and other parts of southeast asia that have this hindu buddhist and before that a kind of animist uh, concept uh, expressed in all those six um, forms that I, I i showed you and also others that's not by any means all of them did you say earlier that the population 
that lives on the sea is about 2 million people? Yes, yes, in the whole of the Capri today, about 2 million. That's amazing. It was a million, you know, a decade ago, but uh, since Batam, since the uh, triangle, you know, that um, economic triangle that um, Manaleta spoke about, since that became very prominent, uh, starting in about 1979, uh, with the oil pipelines under the sea, etc., a lot of uh, workers came from other parts of Southeast Asia to work here. And so there's a lot, there's a very, it's only 30, 30, 34% of the people are Malay or Orang Lao. All the rest of the people in Capri now are migrants from elsewhere. Has the United Nations expressed any particular interest in this region? Uh, you mean because of the Orang Lao, the, um, the, the sea people and their, and their plight? Is that what you're referring to, Ian? Yeah. 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 Yes, well, they have, but um, there's very, very little that can be done because um, it seems uh, there's a kind of um, uh, dislike. The, Malay, the, the general population, the Malays or the migrants, don't get on at all well with the Orang Laut, who are very shy and don't like mixing with um, most of the other people in the province, except for the Chinese, to whom they sell their fish and their other seafood. So, okay, my last question is, does the Indonesia jealously guard this region? Does it, well, it doesn't guard the Orang Laut. They're not really, uh, they don't have much future, a lot of yeah. people think. Yeah. That's what I and this, this has happened in the Dutch period, you know, going back 200 years, 200 years the, uh, the dislike of the Orang Laut and their shyness and their dislike of mixing with other people besides their own kind. So it's a, it's a very sad situation. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. I've been to some of the, and Cynthia Chow has been to a lot of the settlements and she might disagree with you. Would you like to say something, Cynthia? If she's still there? Cynthia is, I think it's 12 midnight where she is in uh, America at the moment, so she might not have stayed. <laughs> but she she has worked uh, in... Right? <laughs> yeah, Margaret. You're there, yeah, hi. Um, <laughs> what's the plight of the, is the United Nations going to help or is anyone going to help the Iron Lout? Uh, well, first of all, I need to, to clarify, uh, when you ask what's the plight of the sea people, uh, the Orang Laut are not to be confused or, you know, mistaken uh, for the refugees. Uh, you know, people come, uh, boat people from, from uh, Vietnam and things like that. Um, indeed, the Orang Suku Laut right now are facing lots of pressures, you know, from uh, the Indonesian authorities because they've regarded this uncivilized and primitive and yeah. so you know, there's a lot of pressure to move them you know onto land and there have been groups of orang suku laut have, who have been moved completely inland and how do you expect a fisher people to suddenly you know take on farming that's uh, extremely difficult uh, and also i think the plight is sort of manifested because uh, large numbers of them you know, uh, who have been moved onto land, uh, find it very difficult to adapt and, you know, have um, fallen into alcoholism and all uh, to cope okay. with the stress. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Cynthia. So we have a question in the chat. Anita, do you want to read it out? Yes, there is another one from Courtney. Is there um, a recognition or awareness of Capri traditional culture at a national level? Uh, it's beginning. Um, some of the theatre troops, you know, the Mandu and the um, Bangsawan and other theatre troops have been performing for the Capri community uh, and students at the Gajamada University in Jogja. They've had concerts, in, they've put on concerts in parts of Indonesia, so they're becoming well known, better, better known. But they're not, by no means well known yet. It's, it's only a 16 year old province. And um, the governor is very keen to make it make it um, well known. And they put on festivals. For example, three or four years ago, we were invited to a festival and a conference where we had to speak about the music of the of the Capri people. And they had processions of people from all over Capri came to uh, at, at their own expense or their government's expense to Tanjung Pinang for a very large uh, festival of arts of all the parts of Pacific. all the islands have got different culture cultural forms not totally different, but very, very many, it's very diverse because the people of Capri have been isolated for so long. Their complaint is that the Jakarta always um, used to give money 
for the money for road building, etc., to Riau province on the Sumatran mainland and always starved the islands, which is why they tried to fight for their own autonomy and got it in 2004 after Suharto stepped down. And um, so it's, um, things are getting better now. And uh, I think and for those big festivals, people come from, from all around the world, from all around the Malay world. And so they are getting better known now, those art forms. Very rarely on television though, national television yet. Thanks, Margaret. Uh, and Rohan has sneakily got in a second question, which I think we do have time for. Um, and it's for Cynthia. Um, uh, are you aware, Cynthia, of the state of the Singaporean orang laut? I've seen them sometimes on cordon off beaches and I'm aware that some of them have ended up moving into public housing blocks. So a question more about uh, the Singapore side, if you know anything, Cynthia. Yeah, well, I think uh, the orang suku laut in, in Singapore uh, have been moved out, you know, by the state uh, of Singapore and asked that either they move into high-rise housing blocks, as you have sort of observed, or, you know, move out of the waters of, of Singapore. And those that have moved into um, high-rise housing blocks, uh, many of them have been relabeled as just Malays. So, uh, you know, it's hard, many, difficult for many people to know that they are descendants of Orang Suku Laut, unless they themselves, you know, acknowledge um, that. Do we have a minute for another question, Sharon? Yeah, I think we'll take one more question. Yeah, there is one from Jared. Given the close proximity of the Riau Island to Singapore, I would like to ask if there has been efforts and or involvements to promote these traditions in Singapore. Yes, yes, there has been actually, because uh, many of the Singapore Malay royals, um, they, they originally came from the islands. They're, for one, for a very long time, Singapore, the island of Singapore was part of the Riau Islands. And so there's a tremendous um, blood relationship between the people, the Malays in Singapore, many of them, and many of them who live in, uh, in the islands. I'm very proud of it. And there's a center of Malay culture in Singapore, it's supported by the Singaporean government. And I've been, I've, I was invited there to speak a few times and uh, some of other people who contribute to our book. And uh, they've got some wonderful displays of the arts of the Malays uh, and the relationship between the uh, islanders and the uh, Singapore, which is just 20 minutes or four, maybe an hour or so away by ferry, um, is quite close. Mm. Lovely, lovely. I'm, I'm going to do a slightly peculiar thing and we're going to formally close the seminar here because I'm being very un-Indonesian and it's six o'clock and we will finish on time. Uh, so I'll, I'll quickly do that in a moment because I know many of you have got other commitments. Um, and so please feel free to log off and you can watch the next little bit uh, in your own leisure. We'll have it up on the Herb Feed uh, website. But for those of us who can stay for another 15 minutes, we're just going to quickly play uh, one minute of a music clip and then we're going to have 10 minutes of a film. So please, if you can stay with us for another 10 minutes. Uh, but if you can't, thank you so much for joining us. It's, it's a pleasure to welcome everybody back in 2021. And as always, I want to give a big that shout Big shout out and thank you to Anita and Rennie and particularly Lauren who was uh, working lots and lots of overtime to get this event up and running and also the Herb Fifth Dialogue uh, which will be happening in a couple of weeks. And finally, we've got a link here uh, to where you can buy this fabulous book. So I really encourage all of you to click on that link uh, and order a copy. So farewell for all of you who have to leave us, but if you can stay, hang in there and we'll quickly go to the other two slots uh, and then we'll see you next month. <laughs>
dia memegang agama Sekali-kali tiada boleh dibilang Karena me Bagang siapa mengenal akhirat Lovely, thank you, thank you. Uh, and that was great that that could come through today and we could uh, play that and everybody almost has managed to say which is fantastic and so now we're gonna um just show 10 minutes i think of a film margaret would you like to say a couple of words about what we're about to see yes okay the short film um, that we'll see is called the viola or the violin in the real islands reefs winds and sea currents and we hope you it'll give you a feel for the watery world of the province this world water world province it's directed by karen katomi thomas formerly lecturer in Asian theatre at Monash University and a Rio Islands theatre researcher. The first public screening of this award-winning film was at the International Ethnograph Film Festival in Montmartre, Paris in 2018, and we are pleased to show it to you today. Karen is also an author of one of the chapters in the book about Mindy, which it features in this film. Thank you, Sharon. The viola is a much played instrument throughout the Rio Islands. It resembles the European violin and its popularity throughout Indonesia and the entire southern Malay world has long been evident. Dozens of musical genres across Indonesia today include the viola as the main melodic instrument and the Rio Islands is no exception. Not only do you find it in both traditional and contemporary musical forms, dance music accompaniments and many other forms of entertainment, but it is also often integral to the music ensembles of theatre such as Mundu and Bangsawan. Kapuluan Riau, or the Riau Islands, is one of Indonesia's newest provinces. It gained autonomy in 2004 from mainland Riau province, which is located on the island of Sumatra. Stretching across 2,400 islands, the province covers a vast geographic area, 96% of which is the sea that connects the islands. Just a two-hour ferry ride from Singapore is located the capital, Tanjung Pinang, on Bintan Island. And it's from there that the local government administers its five archipelagic kabupaten, or regencies. These are the Natuna and Anambas archipelagos in the north, Bintan and Karimun archipelagos in the west, and the Linga archipelago in the south. The first colonial power in Southeast Asia uh, seeking after the spices there, in the, who, which were brought back to, for rich Europeans to, to buy uh, because they liked them in their food, were the Portuguese. They first established their um, fort and settlement, a big one, in Malacca, which is now in um, Malaysia, in that part of the world, very close to the Riau Islands. It's very likely that the Portuguese brought out shiploads of musical instruments and probably gave them to Asian and African slaves in 16th and 17th century Portuguese households in Malacca.
these instruments are violas uh, or vihuelas of the kind that were very common in the Iberian Peninsula at the time of explorations to Asia. These are probably the kinds of instruments that would have arrived in Indonesia and Malaysia with the Portuguese and of course it was their name, viola, that was adopted by the new people who started to use them. The violin became uh, the main melodic instrument, even replaced the, the native suling, the flute, and they had other, uh, other instruments, but um, the stringed orchestra mm -hmm. that they'd played in, the, in Malacca seems to be the, uh, the basis of the Capri, uh, the Rio Islands um, ensemble, which is accompanying the, um, the silat, the art of self-defense, and the dancing, the social dancing. In the Rio Islands, which until recently was had a very low population, most of the people, it seems in the past in particular, were Orang Laut or Suku Laut, people who preferred to live on boats at sea rather than on land. Because this is a very, uh, except in the rainy season, the, uh, the seas are very, I mean, in many parts they're shallow and warm and beautiful and, they love, and the people there uh, just love being on the boats and they, they live on houseboats. And uh, even today, a lot of the viola players, the violinists, are um, sukulaut. In the early 1900s, the Orang Sukulaut music troops, their families and their friends, travelled from island to island by boat, providing entertainment. Groups of artists forming music ensembles often included siblings and their parents, where one would play the gong, one would play the viola, and one would play the gundang drums. Daughters would perform the jogged dance, and members of the audience who wanted to dance with them would be charged. For some Orang Sukulau jogged groups, this was quite a lucrative musical enterprise. The viola is the most popular melodic instrument in the Riau Islands. It accompanies Malay songs and dances all over this Indonesian island province. These are also performed in the Mundu and Bangsawan theatre with poetic song lyrics in Malay verse forms about love, nature, heroic deeds and a myriad of other themes. Such traditional Malay theatre performances were popular forms of village entertainment at least since the late 1800s until the 1950s and 1960s. Mundu, a form of theatre that combined dance, song, dialogue and action, originated in the Natuna archipelago. The viola was commonly the leading instrument performing together with the other instruments of the music ensemble using the gundang and baduk drums and gong. The music ensemble accompanied the songs and dances of the theatre. Its music also indicated scene changes or the start of a new scene. Similarly, the viola is the main musical instrument in Bangsawan theatre, once popular in the Linga archipelago. Both Bangsawan and Mundu have seen a revival by local regencies in the last decade. Leading the Bangsawan music ensemble of the gundang drum and gong, the viola often provides accompaniment performed together with a solo voice before each scene. There's a solo violin, which is rubato almost, whereas when the singer comes in, the meter is much freer. It's very embellished, very beautiful embellishments. Then the violin comes in and often mimics or echoes the singer, almost heterophonic sometimes.
Many musical pieces performed together with the viola also accompany the art of self-defense called Silat Lima from Bintan. Malay music broadly falls into two categories, that of the strictly metered style and a rhythmically freer decorative style. It is the former, the strictly metered style, that accompanies the Silat Lima art of self-defense. <laughs> Viola's melodic style is a Malay-Portuguese hybrid, resembling Portuguese fado folk song, just as Malay jogged social dancing somewhat resembles Portuguese corredinho folk dancing. Indonesia's famous kronchong music and Malaysia's branyo dances also share some traditional Portuguese features. But the 500-year-old Biola tradition now owes little to its hybrid beginnings having developed its own mature styles and repertoires in the Rio Islands and the Malay world in general. Meanwhile, the biola keeps adapting to contemporary times, with some talented village players becoming virtuosos and creating their own repertoires inspired by new dance creations and theatre productions. Kalau di Melayu, itu ada beberapa gerak yang sudah dipakem kan? Antara lain gelanggam, silat, joget, inang, dan juga yang namanya zafin. Ya. Jadi dari gerak itu, Bu, kalau per, dikembangkan, dikembangkan lagi dengan perpaduan musik, uh, maaf, gerak kontemporer dan segala macam, itu namanya tari kreasi Melayu, seperti itu. Jadi membuat membuat uh, ilustrasi buat tari, tari Melayu itu harus tahu dari geraknya dulu. Dalam arti kata, membuat tariannya dulu. The melodies of the biola continue to permeate the soundscape of the Rio Islands, and there is still much more about its significance to be discovered. So uh, it's been a real pleasure to have you all with us, and, and thank you again, Margaret uh, and Harry, for joining us, and we'll see you all next month.